Listeners, beware. This podcast contains themes of the macabre and does not shy away from the details. Our content is graphic and our language is colorful. We might not be your cup of tea, so listener discretion is strongly advised. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 6 of The Killer Tea. On today's episode, we will be discussing Carol Edward Cole, the cannibal cannibal killer. killer. We are your hosts, Chelsea and Christina. Hi! And we're back, and we're together. Yes! We're back recording at my studio in Mooresville. And it's raining, and there's cars driving by, so you know, good times. Yay, fun stuff. But we are going to be setting up Christina's office at her house as a recording studio here in the near future. Yeah, we want to do like the whole actual legit setup. We're going to be official official. Super official. We're just like sticklers for the sound, and every time we have to struggle with sound quality, I feel like- angry. Yeah, we get so grumpy. Anyways, Carol Edward Cole. I set the scene last time. It's your turn. It's my turn. Your turn. All right. Six, 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 six. <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you right now? Are you okay? Yes. Are you fine? Are Do you we having... need to go back to doing this separately? Are you having an aneurysm right now? What's going on? Are you stroking out? Are you Do stroking I need out? to call 911? Do you need CPR? Are you okay? So I'm setting the scene. Because <laughs> clearly Christina soup. can't <laughs> Christina can't get her shit together today. <laughs> so Carol Edward Cole was born on May 9th. 1938 in Sioux City, Iowa. His parents were Laverne and Vesta Cole. His father Laverne was raised in the flatlands of Fargo, North Dakota. In oh, I'm near North Dakota. North Dakota. Don't you know? Don't you know? My family's from Fargo. <laughs> Are they really? I have family in Fargo. You know what a weird coincidence that he was. And my not. Don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> he was born on May 9th, and we're doing this in May. And then you have family from Fargo, North Dakota. Interesting. Interessante. That was not planned. That was an, uh, a weird accident. I was going to say a happy accident, but let's not correlate those two things. <laughs> no. Weird coinky dink. So Laverne, which I just want to say Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> it's been a struggle this entire time. His father eventually moved to Sioux City after quitting school in the seventh grade in order to pursue work, which, as we've discussed several times in the past, was totally common. Totally normal. Not out of out of the ordinary. It's here where he would eventually meet and marry Edward's mother, Vesta Odom. But let's not call him Edward. Oh, yeah. Carol. Carl. 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 <laughs> the couple began their family around 1933 with the birth of their oldest daughter and it wasn't very long before eddie and the rest of the family were born i made a little mental note in my in my little little notes here you made a mental note in your written notes yes (laughs) shut up chelsea i can't we are more productive when we are apart (laughs) fuck (laughs) so vesta was teased all the way up until the wedding night about how virginal she was. She was not a hoe for show. Which will be interesting <laughs> later. <laughs> Laverne, hoping to escape the throngs of the financial ruin that has wreaked havoc across the United States by the Great Depression and by the Dust Bowl, he moved his family and their respective parents 
out west to California. The family patriarch found steady work at a shipyard in Richmond, which was actually owned by a man named Kaiser, and he had four other shipyards. This area, uh, this town of Richmond, was actually famous and known as California's War Baby because the shipyards that Kaiser owned actually mass-produced Liberty ships, which was a cargo class of uh, military ship that they were able to mass-produce, and they actually forked out. 100,000 workers were able to build these massive cargo ships for the U.S. military at a rapid rate of one every 10 hours, seven days a week for the World War II effort. That's pretty freaking fast for a ship. And people didn't have jobs. No, no. So this offered a lot of financial stability to the family because the economic growth in California at, during World War II, at, well, at the very beginning of World War II, honestly, mm-hmm. this is you know a booming economy for them. They must have been overjoyed by their stability and being able to have all this work when the rest of the country was still really struggling through this time. Especially when you have a family of what three or four children i think it was three children two parents and then their respective their respective families yeah so yeah they were able to find a three-bedroom home for all of their family and even though it was crammed everyone was happy they got along really well they were very celebratory and excited to be together and that the father had found work everything was happy happy until Laverne was drafted into World War II in 1943. This is kind of where life takes a turn for them. Vesta is not handling this well. So Laverne is off to war. No idea when he's going to be back. And Vesta really begins to kind of unravel. This especially becomes apparent with her middle son. One day, Carol is outside playing with his trucks and his soldiers and he's minding his own business keep in mind he's just a little guy at this point yeah i think he's he's five years old his siblings are out with family because his mother had the family actually take them but for some reason edward didn't go with them she says to him get cleaned up we're gonna go quote unquote visiting oh and visiting they sure did yeah we're gonna start the trauma nice and early vesta took Carol to a rundown part of town to this shoddy apartment building where he had never been before and it was there she stopped and turned and warned him in a very serious way something that he was not used to with her and said whatever happens don't you dare tell anyone you understand me and from that point on everything for Carol changed dramatically. He was forced to basically hang around while his mother slept with men that were at the apartment. You have a six-year-old. Oh my God. They're aware. It's not like he was just totally oblivious to what was going on around him. He might not have had words or a full understanding, but he knew that that guy was not daddy and mommy was doing things with him that he's only supposed to be doing with daddy. First of all, the child shouldn't even be witnessing these acts happening, let alone at the age of five or with your mother, with someone who is not your father. In this apartment, there's other couples in there. There's a woman who's breastfeeding. There's two other couples who are fondling each other. And he's just left out there in this living room where when his mom goes into the other room with a man that he doesn't know. What the (sighs) fuck? Yeah, so... At some point in time, Vesta reappears out of the bedroom and she allows Carol to go outside and play where a group of children proceed to bully him because they find out his name is Carol, which apparently even at that time was still considered girly. Yes, it's, I mean, it's girl. It's considered a woman's name now. I didn't know until I we did research on him that it was still considered a girl's name then as well. This ends up drawing the attention of Vesta, and they end up leaving the apartment. She immediately blames Carol for being bullied. I mean, what? And she's blaming him for her, quote, ruined night. It doesn't stop there. She berates him the entire way home. But once they actually get home, 
she starts beating Carol with her hands and a belt, twisting his arm and telling him that he needs to keep it to himself, that he's not allowed to tell anybody about their trip into town or the strange men that his mother was visiting. Basically beats the crap out of her five-year-old kid to ensure that he is terrified of even mentioning the situation. He doesn't even know why he's being punished, but she's calling these punishments for his behavior when he was the one being bullied by that group of kids. These affairs continue to go on, and for whatever reason, Vesta keeps bringing Carol around? I don't understand. That part completely puzzles me because you would think if the family, if her family is willing to take the baby and his older sister, they'd be more than willing to take Carol as well. Yeah, I so don't. So it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense on why she would continue to take him with her. I mean, not only is that like really fucked up and weird. The only thing that I can think of is that she is going through a, she's going through something and she's able to just take her frustration. She uses him as a punching bag. Well, of course she does. But that's what my thinking is why she's taking him <clears throat> is so that way she has someone to take the brunt of her frustrations. Or I mean, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It doesn't make any, any sense to me. No, it doesn't. So after all of these quote unquote outings, he then gets beaten by his mother again, ensuring that he will stay silent about it. You know, he's at the mercy of the other adults that are at the apartments while she's there hooking up with people that aren't his father. Yeah, these are soldiers, actually. The people that she's hooking up with are soldiers. They participate sometimes in beating him, which is, ooh, that makes me... That makes my hair on the back of my neck stand straight up and me want to punch somebody because the idea of somebody else disciplining my child. Ooh. Ooh. It's, it's not okay. This is his introduction to sex. And then it's being coupled with violence, which we know does not end in well-adjusted human beings. Even though he's a child, like I mentioned earlier, and he, he feels guilt and shame, even though his father isn't there, he knows he's got a burden of a secret and while again he doesn't fully understand what that means he knows something is wrong as time goes on the punishments start to get worse and Vesta actually gets more I hate to say creative with her punishments but that's exactly what she does at the very least she gets more cruel she begins making Carol dress in his sister's frilly dresses and then invites other guests over to their home where she would then make Carol serve them their coffee. And then she would tease him about being dressed as a girl. She would call him mama's little girl. And she ends up even keeping him home from school for an entire year. Which at that time was in fact against the law. But because the world war was going on, you know, it just, it slipped through the cracks. He was five, so he should have been in school. And then when he does finally actually start, then that makes him six. And he's going to be a year ahead of everybody else. Right, which is automatically going to make it even worse make for it, him. Make it worse for him, absolutely. By 1944, a year after his father's departure to war, the abuse essentially started to grow roots in Eddie where it's now it's starting to manifest right mm -hmm. so it's not just him getting upset in little ways anymore it's him actually finding isolation away from his friends away from his siblings away from, certainly away from his mother oh definitely he would they actually had a crawl space underneath the house and that was like his safe haven he would go under there with all of his toys and when his mom would call for him and look for him, he just wouldn't answer. He'd ignore her. Yeah. Because that was his only escape away from it other than school. Poor Carol is going through all of this, but his father finally is able to come home. When Laverne gets home, the abuse almost stops entirely because if you think about it, like he didn't know that all of this was going on the entire time he was gone. It started after he left and it stopped when he got home. However, the damage has already been done. Mm -hmm. So Carol is not the sweet little boy that, that he, remembers. he remembers. He is now withdrawn and quiet and very sullen and doesn't interact with basically anybody. And Laverne is 
is concerned. He wants to know what has happened to his little boy. So during a family cookout to celebrate Laverne coming home, Carol is completely overwhelmed by the presence of his father and this guilt that he's carrying with him. He's now six years old and he knows that he's harboring his mom's secret. As the family cookout is going on, he's just miserable. His dad takes notice of this and he must have said something to Vesta. Mm. So Vesta makes up some excuse to kind of escort him away from the party and brings him into the house and puts him in one of the rooms and then just lets go on him. She grabs him by his ears and twists them to the point that he's screaming and crying out in pain. He begs her to stop and then she takes his arm and twists it behind his back. She starts threatening him with more abuse if he utters one word to his father about the stuff that he saw while his dad was away. And then she tells him that he needs to go out and act totally normal and behave. A six-year-old little boy. I mean, I can't even imagine how terrified this little boy must be of his mother because he's being tortured for her indiscretions and being forced to keep her secret that he didn't even have to be there he, for. He shouldn't even know about. And unfortunately, it never gets better for him. Everything just escalates for him. So he's finally in school, and the abuse at home has died down. Not maybe stopped completely, but at least lessened. But where it stopped at home, it's picking up at school. Yeah, he's getting bullied because of the name Carol. And I looked, but I couldn't find any reason why his parents may have named him Carol. He was harassed endlessly throughout his entire life for his name. He has to make a decision. It's either he continues to be harassed and takes these beatings by bullies or he stands up for himself. And he just he decides to stand up for himself. So he kind of develops a reputation even at so young where he, these kids are picking on him and he fights back. Um, he performed fairly well, even though he found difficulty concentrating and would often daydream. And this is something that he carries throughout his entire school career. He's always going to be a daydreamer. Well, I'm interested in this daydreaming because in his young adolescent years, he actually starts experiencing blackouts. Mm -hmm. in periods of time where he can't account for what he's been doing. And he actually ends up strangling the family dog during one of these blackouts and doesn't know why or what happened or how he even got a hold of the dog. But he's actually not even punished for this. His family's just kind of like, eh, eh, okay, well, don't do it. No, now, you don't, it now you don't have a dog. Happened. But this, <laughs> starts him off fantasizing about killing his mother and other women. And these fantasies start kind of coming up at the age of seven. Like, he's a little boy. The Coles also sent their children to a Catholic class for after school taught by nuns who still practice corporal punishment. He was not really interested in learning about the religion. And I mean, there's some mixed information here, but for the most part, they say that his family wasn't really all that devout anyway. So he just wasn't invested. And mind you, he had been abused. He's already a daydreamer. He's just not paying attention. And because of this, the sisters would actually strike him over his knuckles with a ruler. I think this is an interesting thing with him because we have his mother, who is a female authoritative presence in his life that okay. is abusing him. Abuse him relentlessly. And then you add in these female nuns who are now also hurting him and causing him pain. This is forming opinions in his very young mind about women. Essentially, he's associating women with pain. The burden of carrying his mother's secret weighed very heavily on Carol, and it was a constant source of anxiety for him. Up until the point that his dad left, he described having a very loving relationship with his mother. That's why this was such a shock to him. But after his dad returned, their relationship just never improved. There, it was a constant... Well, there's no recovery from no, that. No, no, not at all. 
He was very bitter, and she kind of treated him with, like, an air of suspicion, always waiting for the pin to drop, for mm-hmm. him to, to tell her secret. And the mistreatment just, even if it wasn't smacking and beating, it just never changed for him. And he was always worried and wary of his mother's wrath that one day she was just going to flip out and beat the shit out of him again. Yeah. Around the age of seven, this seems to be when things really kind of start to escalate for him. He was trapped by his brother's friend and a neighbor in the bathroom. And according to Carol, he doesn't fully remember the entire thing, but he was taught how to masturbate by his brother's friend and their neighbor. And he discredits this whole entire thing as nothing bad happened. Something bad He's happened. He's seven. He's yes. seven. He unfortunately more, he was probably molested is what I'm, I'm going to guess. And from this period on, he begins this lifelong masturbation. It's almost like, it's like a coping mechanism yeah, almost. Yeah, it's almost like a coping mechanism or even escapism because he would masturbate to these really gnarly, disgusting fantasies. Yeah. And, and he's a small child. He's a small, he's seven. To recap, he's been bullied for his name, made to wear his sister's dresses, called a girl by his mother, has been beaten by his own mother, and has now been molested by a neighbor. So, you know, we're... We're really doing great in this seven-year-old's life. On top of being what we assume to be molested, he's masturbating ritually and is even caught by his mother as he's masturbating because he's doing it with the door wide open. Like he has no, well, he's he's seven. He doesn't doesn't understand that this is something that's private. So shortly after this incident, Carol was actually playing with a female family member who was close to his age, and he convinced her to play doctor, which is a totally normal thing Mm -hmm. for seven-year-olds to play. But he took it too far, and he molested her and attempted to actually rape her. But he's not successful in doing this. I mean, he's still a little boy. He doesn't really understand what he's doing and to be fair he probably has no idea that what he's doing is wrong look at what his mother has exposed him to and isn't it a thing that you see in children who are sexually assaulted that oftentimes they try and mimic what has been done to them yeah so i kind of this is again why i'm fairly certain that he actually was molested is he's trying to normalize what happened to him right so carol would go on to participate in several neighborhood fights with children who bullied him. I mean, bullying is going to be a theme throughout pretty much this kid's entire adolescence. He always stood up for himself, but a common theme was that he was consistently outnumbered by other children. So one time he gets into this really bad fight and gets the absolute shit kicked out of him by several kids. He goes home, tells his dad about it, and you know, his dad is back from the war. Like, he's he's got a very high opinion of him and his his masculinity. Oh, absolutely. But Laverne confronts the boys and actually the father of the boys that are there, and while there's almost an altercation, Laverne ultimately decides, you know what, no. And he takes Carol and leaves. This absolutely humiliates Carol because he was looking for his dad to stand up for him and it was almost like he let him down he felt humiliated and it's sad because Laverne doesn't know everything that his boy has been put through yeah he is unaware of I would say probably 90% of what Carol's been through at this point and doesn't understand that he really needed his dad to be there for him in this instant. However, it is worth mentioning that while his dad is a soldier and was a really hard worker Mm -hmm. and provided for the family and yada, 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 he was very macho on the outside, but on the inner workings of their family, the matriarch, wore the pants vesta was the one who made the final decisions and if you if it wasn't vesta's way it was the highway i can understand 
why Carol needed his dad to, to do some serious masculinity testosterone stuff. Yeah. I understand it. I get it. He is playing outside with one of his best friends who happens to be a girl. And they're wrestling and playing around and she actually bests him in a scrap. So she ends up on top of him and she's she's a little girl. She doesn't know any better. She has not gone through what Carol has gone through. No. So she pins him on his back using her thighs and that puts her junk in his face and he has all kinds of reactions. Super confused, doesn't know what to do, very ashamed, but also he is having a physical reaction to it. At the same time, She's kind of suffocating him. Yeah. <laughs> he can't breathe. There's a lot going on in his little brain. And his mom comes out, sees this all unfold, pulls the girl off of him. And instead of disciplining that girl or saying something to that girl, she beats the fuck out of Carol. Right. So As, once again, you know, totally makes sense. He's overpowered by a woman, he's humiliated. And a woman that he's supposed to trust did not help him. No, she actually backhands him so hard across the face that he falls to the ground. She goes to continue to beat him and Vesta's sister just happens to arrive for a visit at that time and witnesses Vesta assaulting her son, basically. She is beyond upset and begs Vesta to just let her have Carol since Vesta clearly hates her son so much. Of course, Vesta would never let this happen because what if she tells her sister her secret? Yeah, she calls her a busybody. And it's not even like it was a normal punishment. Like she was beating her child, a seven-year-old little boy. Carol describes it as like her fist was fully cocked, ready to like blast him in the face again. I couldn't... Oh, my God. I can't even imagine. It's hard with, like... Okay, guys. I know that future Carol is a serial killer, and he's disgusting and horrible. But he's not a serial killer yet. He's a little boy. And it just... It it breaks my heart that this little boy went through all of this, especially knowing the effects that this had on him as an adult. Yeah, I have no I have no problem saying that this is essentially what caused him to be the way that he was. That's 100% what caused him to be the way that he was. When Carol is 8 years old, the bullying became way too much for him and he snaps. And he's invited by a friend to go swim at a local lake. And he goes on to actually drown a little boy, it's one of his tormentors, whose name is Dwayne, in the lake that they're at. The community actually believed that it was an accidental drowning. No questions were asked. He was never um, suspected of anything. Actually, what had happened was it was him and Dwayne playing. The game escalated. He decided at that point in time, you know what? They had gotten in a fight earlier that day. He got decked in the face. They ended up being amicable. But from that point on, he was like, I'm going to get fucking revenge. And he gets the kid alone, drowns him in the water, like wraps his leg around the kid's throat while they're underwater and waits until he can't get breathe anymore. And there's no more bubbles coming up out of his mouth. And Dwayne's little body sinks to the bottom of the lake he gets out and just goes about his business and the kids are kids they're not paying any fucking attention they're eight years old they they're running around playing with their group of friends and so they go home and it's only later when they're like oh where'd Dwayne go and that's when his body is later discovered it's actually believed that Carol is the youngest serial killer because he his first murder was when he was eight years old I mean it's I believe that he did it. I mean, there's evidence that that actually did happen, that he drowned and he's taking responsibility for it. So, yeah, who knows? From this point on, Carol Cole becomes mean and bitter and violent. He begins to fantasize about bludgeoning his best friends. 
In the sixth grade, he becomes a school crossing guard, which is his first real position of power or any authority. Like it's the first time he feels in control and he finds himself daydreaming of what it would be like to kind of mis intentionally misdirect the kids to cross the street whenever there's oncoming traffic and kill all of them. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and then during the summer, some kids were playing on road equipment that sort of stuff he knew how to get the equipment moving and he specifically waited for a kid to stick his hands in some of the gears he started up the machine or put it in gear or whatever permanently maimed this child for the rest of his life he has become really vindictive and just cruel at this point the abuse has materialized into a demented angry child it really has by high school the family had moved we are now introduced to eddie he uses this as an opportunity to just get rid of his identity as carol and start over as eddie cole when he goes to this new school at harry ellis he starts a whole new social life and he actually finds that he gets along pretty well with everyone. He's not getting into fights anymore. He does fairly okay with the ladies, but he's not doing so great with his grades where he excelled really well in elementary school and did well in school. In high school, he's not doing that great. He's averaging Ds and Cs, not failing, but not excelling yeah. and what's crazy is he was given an IQ test and he got a 152 which in case you didn't know is genius level yeah I've taken an, an IQ test and I'm a 109 so <laughs> yeah so I'm perfectly average he's I think it's anything over 140 it's is, genius is level genius. I think you're right I think isn't and that what level is Mensa level I'm not sure I want to say it's like 150 so he is very, very intelligent, but is clearly not applying himself. He and just doesn't care. He just, about no, him. he doesn't care. One day while he's at school, he spots a two on one fight. And if you remember, a lot of Eddie's childhood was spent being outnumbered in fights. Even though he had maintained a pretty low key new life at this school high school this sets him off and just hulks out gets in the middle of this fight and takes out both of the guys who are have beaten this other kid to a pulp and this actually earned him a lot of notoriety at the school and he got all kinds of attention and these female students are kind of i don't want to say throwing themselves at him but low-key throwing themselves at him and he actually kind of develops a fixation with his physical appearance because one of the girls had said to him, you look good, I wonder if you feel good too. So for the rest of his high school through like his early 20s, he's kind of preoccupied with maintaining his physical appearance because he finally realized, oh, hey, I can get attention through that. That being said, <laughs> the dark fantasies never stopped. No, he continues to dream of killing people, but instead of dreaming of bludgeoning his best friend or drowning someone, he begins to fantasize about killing pretty teenage girls that he would see when he's out and about. He eventually would start beginning this nighttime patrol session or route where he would start scouting the area for unaccompanied young women but he never found an opportunity where it was right to attack somebody. Yeah, he said he just never was able to find one that was alone. Right. The last summer before he dropped out of high school, he decides that he's going to lose his virginity. And he comes pretty close with one girl who is two years older than him. Which, that is a feat. Yes. Even to this day, that is a feat. But when it comes time to do the deed, he can't maintain an erection. So the girl tries to wiggle away and kind of leave the situation. It's, I'm sure it's very awkward. He becomes super angry and confused and suddenly has this idea of, oh, I could strangle her. And he ends up pinning her down, 
seriously considering doing it, but snaps to his senses and realizes he can't do this, and he lets her go. Carol begins to miss school and starts partaking in a string of petty burglaries. He's actually going to the local liquor store, <laughs> stealing, and then he and his buddies take the alcohol to school and are essentially just drunk on school grounds during lunchtime and pretty much all the time when he actually does show up to the school because most of the time he's just fucking truant. Right. One of these times, he and a friend are actually caught in the act. The police had started scouting, waiting for the people to come and catch him in the act. Right. His friend was able to get bailed out by his parents. And while Laverne originally wanted to bail him out, Vesta overrules him and forces Eddie to stay in jail for two weeks. So this is yet another example of his dad letting him down and his mom overpowering the male influence in his life. And it just, it sticks with him. He does several petty crimes, spends some time in juvie. He's got this boiling resentment of his father, hatred of his mother. He oddly lies his way into the National Guard because he's like 16. They were able to get, him and his friend were able to get a fake ID. He gets found out, is kicked out, but the judge took pity on him because he was so young and decides, you know, eh, you're not gonna get a dishonorable discharge. At this point, he's just kind of trudging through his life in between getting in kind of trouble, but nothing too serious. And eventually his parents decide, you know what? We're gonna send you to go spend the rest of your summer with your brother and his wife, and you're gonna clean up your act. But that doesn't necessarily work. (laughs) While living with his brother and his brother's wife, he could tell that she, the wife, was actually physically interested in Ed, and it was very uncomfortable for him. He got a job to try and avoid her. But the brother and the wife did break up, but this cast Eddie out and he was forced to move back home with his parents, but also get a job. And while at this job, he came across a drunk dude who was a patron um, of the bar that he worked at or of the restaurant that he worked at and who called him a queer. And this set Eddie into a murderous rage because he has a lot of repressed masculinity issues or sexuality issues, I should say. Yes. And tried to kill him (laughs) with a broken bottle in front of everyone. Oh my God. (laughs) Uh, He was stopped, but it caused him to lose his job. And now he drops out of school on his 18th birthday. Lord have mercy. mercy. He starts dating one of his little sister's friends. He goes to their apartment one night and is waiting for them outside when he sees a car pull up and it's his little sister, his girlfriend, and two other dudes and they are making out and being handsy. So his mom, who is this adulterous woman who had a Multiple string affairs. of affairs, he now just sees his first serious girlfriend cheating on him and his sister who he fucking trusts implicitly betray him needless to say doesn't go over very well for eddie no because it's yet another woman that he trusted that completely fails him he believes that she failed to protect him by allowing his girlfriend to cheat on him yeah he i mean in all honestly he wasn't that bothered by the girlfriend cheating on him because he kind of has this impression that all women are tramps and that's a theme that he carries with him for pretty much at ever. this point all women are untrustworthy yeah the women in his life these are the examples that he's been given i can understand yeah totally he how he he has learned to associate all women with pain and suffering ed's resentment for women had at this point blossomed into full-blown hatred he just he's done he is no longer interested in dating he he just writes off women for the time being and in fact he even said that from that point on he envisions killing every woman that he would meet which is interesting because there's a quote from him later on in life that kind of rolls back into this that I just find fascinating. Mm -hmm. Carol ends up leaving his family to join the Navy. This was in 1957. He's enlisted as active duty and is put on a ship taking him to several different places. He goes to Australia, 
China, Formosa. Where is Formosa? I don't know. <laughs> I felt like I should know, and I didn't look it up, but I don't yeah. know where Formosa is. And he even goes to Japan. During this time, as a sailor, women flock to him, but he never ends up sleeping with any of them. Yeah, his virginity remains intact. And well, he's he 18? Ad- he attempts it many times, but his fear of not being able to perform terrifies him. And he would just play it cool and boast of his quote-unquote many conquests. I should have looked up some of the psychology on what impotence, how that affects a man's development. If you think about it, though, earlier on, he couldn't maintain an erection the first time he tried to lose his virginity. So now he's like overhyped himself, terrified. But, so he's a chronic masturbator. But when he masturbates, he fantasizes about strangling and killing women. Mm-hmm. So he's now associated strangling and killing with sexual pleasure. So he very well could have made it impossible for him to actually maintain an erection without strangling someone. Ed would go on to be discharged from the Navy after he confesses to impulsively stealing guns and firing them into the night while intoxicated. He is handed a very hefty punishment. For some reason, still isn't discharged. They actually, their solution is to send him to the brig for three months. I mean, the brig is basically naval prison. Yeah. He's guarded there by three marine or two or three marines that are they're marines but on paper they're part of the navy mm-hmm. and they beat the ever loving fuck out of him every day for 3 months and he finally cannot take it anymore and he goes to the military court and says look I want discharge any which way you can get me out get me out yep This was on, I think, October the 1st, and he was out within, he was out and home with his parents within four days. Well, when he gets home, the abuse from his mother just doesn't stop because she continuously rubs his nose in his failures. His lack at being able to have a job, at failing at the military, she's just verbally and emotionally abusive now. We've moved on from physical and into psychological abuse. Fun. He does try to have a normal life, whatever that looks like to him. Finally, at the age of 20, he does actually lose his virginity, but it doesn't bring him satisfaction. It's anticlimactic for him. He doesn't get the sense of pleasure from sex the same way that he does from his masturbation. And instead, those violent fantasies continue to persist no matter how many partners he had. And he describes it as not giving a fuck who he had in his bed. It did nothing for him. He kind of gets into this weird pattern of he would get a new job and then he would get in trouble for something, whether that's petty theft or DUIs. He's always getting into some sort of trouble. And he's back and forth between his parents' house and living with his sister and getting his own place. He's eventually forced to permanently move back in with his parents because he was living with his sister and she had an incredibly jealous husband no matter what she did, deserving or not. And from what he described, it seems like it was really undeserving Mm -hmm. and even though he has this hatred of women he still does love his sister Mm -hmm. so he is in the back of their car and her husband starts berating her or her boyfriend starts berating her he's not gonna listen to it anymore he actually rears back and kicks the fucking husband in the head yeah so that gets him booted permanently from their household yeah and he ends up getting a drunk driving charge. He's really just not doing well. One night, he's out and about on the town, wanders into this bar, and actually catches his mother, Vesta, kissing and touching another man that is not his father. Are you shocked by that? I'm not shocked by that at all. Vesta does not see him at first, but eventually they would come to lock eyes and she grins at him because she knows he's not gonna do fuck all about it. And this, what as Rob would say, boils his piss because she's right. 
and he hates her for it, but he does he doesn't want to further deteriorate his father by revealing to him what is going on. So he buries his pain and his anger in alcohol that night and then sets his eyes on a bartender who he's going to stalk and attempt to kill. He he describes it as hunting her. But then at the end of the night, when he's stalking her, she starts to notice that something odd is going on and ends up meeting up with friends. So his plans are completely diverted yet again. But he really has reached this kind of fever pitch. In 1960, Cole's frustrations have boiled over. He feels guilt in regards to his father and all the transgressions that he knows about. He loathes his mother and can't do anything about it. And he finally decides he's going to act on his violent impulses and ends up spotting a couple on Lover's Lane, tangled together, doing what you do on Lover's Lane. (laughs) He grabs a hammer from his own car and begins to stalk around the car. He breaks the windows, terrifies the couple, but the man in the car is able to rest, wrestle the hammer from Ed, and he bolts. He had to know that he was caught at this point. Like, this is a small town. The female in the car got a full look of his face. So he bolts it. He does make it home. But the cops come to pick him up the next day, and they book him for assault or a deadly weapon. He's convicted, but he's only sentenced to 30 days in the county jail. Oh, no. Not even jail. He's sentenced to 30 days on the county work farm, where they're actually paid to work there, but it's considered a punishment. At the time that he was arrested, there was no psych evaluation done, let alone available at the time. Obviously, this is the 1960s, not a whole lot of funds available for criminal psychology. It's okay, we understand. But when he got out, he decided that he was going to straighten out his life again for the 100th time in january of 1961 he actually flags down a patrol officer and confesses to this officer that he is plagued by urges to rape and strangle women the officer suggests voluntarily committing himself to a mental hospital and so he does he was admitted to the napa state hospital on february 2nd 1961 for 90 days He's self-committed, but while he's there, he says that he had a happy childhood and basically refuses to discuss any bad aspects of his life. So he's really not putting a really honest effort into this. No, he's really not helping himself a whole lot here. On March 21st of 1961, the hospital staff makes a diagnosis about him, and he is diagnosed with antisocial sociopath personality disturbance. I couldn't, I got a whole lot of nothing on this one. No, I think this is probably a precursor for maybe antisocial personality disorder. He kind of, I don't know. This This is a weird one. When I tried to look it up, I couldn't really find much on it. But it's recommended that he be discharged because this is considered a personality disorder and not a mental illness. And at that time, state hospitals wouldn't keep you in inpatient treatment for personality disorders they would only keep you inpatient for mental illness because personality disorders were considered treatable where Mm -hmm. mental illness was not considered treatable at this time so it's recommended that he voluntarily seek admission to the atascadero state hospital due to his sadistic and abnormal sexual tendencies Yeah, we're going to see him in and out of mental hospitals and institutions for for years. Um, Only a few days later, he was released from the Napa State Hospital and essentially tries to go back to living a normal life, but he kind of becomes a compulsive thief at this point. Later on in life, he would say that he just fucked it up so bad that what was the point? What was the point? So that takes us to July of 1961. He um, gets picked up for auto theft. And while he's picked up for auto theft, he actually requests psychiatric help. He tells the judge, and it is Judge Raymond Coughlin, he needs psychiatric help. He knows what's going on in his brain isn't okay. He needs the help. So 
At this point, a judge actually signs off on his committal orders, which basically says that he's legally required to get psychiatric help. And this is when he enters the Atescadero State Hospital. He's admitted there. It's not outpatient treatment anymore. It's inpatient, hardcore treatment. Dr. Irwin Hart diagnosed him as a passive dependent person. What is that passive dependent person? I almost is that want codependent? I think that's more like codependency, but maybe not as aggressive. Hmm, interesting. Or maybe he's like passively codependent on people. I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's described as a passive dependent person with a facade of independence and confusion concerning sexual identification. Which, Are they alluding to that he's dependent on his mother, do you think? Possibly. It really all depends on how honest he's being at this point. Yeah, that's a valid point. In September of 1962, he gets transferred from Atescadero Hospital to Stockton State Hospital and they sent him there for further testing and treatment. So obviously the doctors thought that something else was going on at this point. That's where a Dr. Weiss starts kind of digging into his psyche a little bit more. And he notes that, <laughs> shocker, <laughs> that Cole seems to be afraid of the female figure. Also has in his notations that he's unable to have intercourse with a female without first killing her. And here we go. <laughs> Weiss diagnosed Cole's condition as, I know, you're gonna be shocked, schizophrenic. <laughs> a schizophrenic reaction of chronic undifferentiated type. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I have no what idea. It? I feel like so many of these things are just catch-alls. Well, it is a catch-all. I mean, we're talking the 1960s. Yeah. Being diagnosed as a, schizo as a schizoid was pretty common at this point. That's didn't like, have a whole lot else if you to have go anything on. wrong with you, you're schizophrenic. <laughs> yeah. So it's I ridiculous. Don't, I don't know how much treatment he actually got. I'm gonna go with not a lot was actually helpful for him. But on April 19th, 1963, he's released from the mental hospital pretty much indefinitely. They're just like, okay. Bye. Go, go, bye. He's released from the hospital. He's released to his parents because where the fuck else is he gonna go? And his mother's like, yeah, no, you're not staying here. And buys him a bus ticket to Dallas to stay with his brother. And his brother spends the next couple weeks showing him around. Well, in July, he attempts to commit suicide. After he fails to strangle a woman. So he's in Dallas, attempts to strangle someone, fails at it, and then attempts suicide, and then is sent to a psychiatric ward for four days, where he doesn't mention that he tried to strangle a woman, just that he attempted to commit suicide. But then he ends up meeting Neville Whitworth, who was an alcoholic yeah. stripper. Wait, okay, can we talk about this for a second? She's a stripper, yet he's regarded all women, he devalues all women in his life because he considers them tramp. he's, tramps. He's not bothered with having relations with them because they're tramps. But then he turn around. And marries a stripper. Yeah. I don't get it either. He marries her in November of 1963, and she goes by Billy. Because I mean, who wants to be called Neville? I mean, unless you're Neville Longbottom. <laughs> Two years later, Cole would burn down a fucking motel in a furious rage, convinced that Billy was having an affair on him. Yeah. So he's charged with arson, obviously. <laughs> and sent to prison. For two years. And his marriage ends. Yeah. <laughs> so he's... <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> He's released from prison in January of 1967. So he didn't really serve the full two years, if my math is correct. <laughs> but he's released, and he begins drifting. He doesn't really have anywhere that he can go. And this is where it really starts to get even more fucked up. If you can believe that this gets more fucked up, it definitely does. He decides that he's going to try and strangle an 11-year-old girl. And then this gets him a five-year sentence in prison. 
Yeah, in Lake Ozark, Missouri. That's where he decides to strangle an 11-year-old girl. He sneaks into her bedroom, tries to strangle her while she's sleeping, and God bless this girl, she screams her freaking head off and ends up drawing the attention, but he pleads guilty and is given a reduced charge in the five-year prison term. I, I don't understand the justice system sometime. This man breaks into your home, tries to strangle your small child, and you give him, well, not you, the courts give him a reduced charge. And not only that, in May of 1970, he actually gets parole and ends up drifting back to San Diego, then to Reno, Nevada, where he attempts to strangle women twice in bars, mm-hmm. but both of it, but both the women escape. So he's out on parole and immediately tries to strangle someone. And not only someone, two someones. We don't know who they are, but he tried. I'm so conflicted on this. I can't tell if he's genuinely wanting help or if he just can't get back on his feet so he keeps trying to get back into these mental institutions. Well, there's there's theories coming up on that. Oh, oh, oh. tell me more. Oh, I, yep, I can't wait. Theories. I want to hear. So on September 17th of 1970, he surrenders himself to the Reno police and confesses his urges to murder women. He ends up being detained and charged with disorderly conduct. And then on September 23rd of 1970, He's committed to a state hospital in Sparks, Nevada. And this is where, I'm sorry, Dr. Felix Peebles, (laughs) Dr. Peebles diagnoses him with antisocial personality with alcoholism and compulsion to strangle and rape attractive women. Even though he did time in prison for strangling an 11 year old. But then, shortly after that recants his diagnosis and said that this is a quote cole was a highly manipulative man who is utilizing his difficulties with the law and his threats of violence in order to acquire shelter when he is out of funds so basically what you just said okay he did though i do genuinely think the first time that he went in it was him being overwhelmed with guilt and not knowing how to survive in the fucked up head that he has i just don't know if i believe it all these other times yeah i agree i mean i I mean maybe i'm wrong because the first time wouldn't you think that he would if he if that was the true what i initially said that he would try and be forthcoming with correct information about his childhood so maybe i'm gonna recant what i just said maybe he actually was manipulating him this whole entire time i don't know i don't know I mean, we can agree that he definitely has something going on mentally. I mean, he was abused pretty much his entire childhood. I don't know. Well, he's discharged from the hospital and placed on a bus to go to Los Angeles, where he has to switch buses and go home to San Diego. So this gives him opportunity. And on May 7th of 1971, he commits his second murder. He actually meets a woman named Essie Buck. She's 39 years old, and he strangles her and leaves her in his trunk Mm -hmm. overnight and then discards her body the next day, which just so happens to be his 33rd birthday. Two weeks after this murder, he kills yet another woman. She remains unidentified, which is something that we're going to see more of. He said her name was Wilma, but that's all they know about her. Apparently, he allegedly buried her body in the woods, and he claimed that these killings were done because these women were unfaithful, and it was like divine retribution. Yeah, he calls all these women, quote-unquote, loose women, (laughs) but his definition of loose women makes literally no sense. I don't know. This is hardcore mommy issues. Oh, for sure. Because on May 30th, 1971, a mere seven days later, he strangles a third unknown victim. Which just... I I don't even know. But here's the messed up part. From June 1971 to March of 1972, he serves time in prison for theft and drunk driving. So he's committing these murders 
But he's not being picked up for these murders. Mm -mm. He's being picked up for... He's almost always picked up for alcohol. And theft. And theft. And Ugh. even then, when no matter how many times he gets picked up for these things, he doesn't really do serious time for no. any of them. He's, it's always just a little slap on the wrist for him. So he's released in March of 1972. So sometime between his release in March and the summer of 1972, he drives up to San... Yisdro? Yisdro? Is that right? San Yisdro? We're going to go with it. Sidro? Sidro? And he picked up oh. two unknown women, killed one with a hammer, again with a hammer, and the other one was strangled. They were both buried in the desert somewhere and obviously could not be found. Mm. So these are, yet again, more unidentified women. That summer, he found love. <laughs> again. He married Diane Parshall in July of 1973, and of course, <laughs> neither of them could remain faithful to the other or control their alcoholism. <laughs> but they got married anyway in July of 1973 and fought the entire time. <laughs> it is anyone who knew them said that they literally fought continuously, continuously cheated on each other and just didn't have a happy marriage. But in August of 1974, they up and moved to Las Vegas from San Diego. Between August of 1974 and 1975, he found a job transporting coins from a local airport to the nearby casinos. But he couldn't help himself. <laughs> and he stole an entire shipment of these coins. And then he fled back to Wyoming. Leaving and Diana. Left, left Diana in Vegas. Like, oh my. He's just, he's an A-plus husband, what can I say? In August of 1975, he met Miraline T.P. Hamer. And after a night of partying, she was like, hey, hey, you want to have some sex? And he was like, sure. But then he strangled her and left her body on the hillside and covered her with a fucking sleeping bag. Made a lot of effort to cover it up. So her body was eventually found. Of but course it was fucking found. <laughs> he didn't know. He literally put zero no effort, effort zero into effort. covering up her body. Piece of flaming garbage. And of course, like the bitch he is, flees the state immediately. At some point in time after this, he goes ahead and is like, I'm an alcoholic and decides that he's going to go to a, he's going to go through detox and, and puts himself into a detoxification center. Where he then steals a fellow patient's $1,500 check and cashes it. So? So still, flaming pile of garbage. But he gets caught and is charged with mail theft in June of 1976 and jumps bail. What does that mean? Jumps bail. He is bonded out, but then okay. doesn't show up doesn't to his court up. date. Got it. He ends up getting captured a short time later and then is also charged with unlawful flight because he fucking jumped bail. Fled. <laughs> and he ends up getting sentenced to one year in prison, but is released early. <sighs> Again, with the releasing early. May of 1977, police recovered the body of Kathleen Blum, who was 26 years old and a prostitute that he had strangled and dumped in somebody's backyard. In July of 1977, he is once again picked up for car theft, but in Vegas. He makes bail, then goes to Oklahoma City. To be fair, he is jumping around a lot, and there is no, the, the there's no official tracking system yeah. here. The police departments they don't talk to each other. Yeah. So what he's done in one city isn't necessarily catching up with him in another city, and especially between states, he jumps around through states a lot too. Thanksgiving, uh, well, the eve of Thanksgiving, 1977, he meets a woman at a topless bar. Again, he has this opinion of women, yet he keeps putting seeking his, them out. Yeah, he puts himself in these situations where he's basically putting him in the way of women who he considers decided. to be inferior. Yeah. Okay, <sighs> whatever. But he agrees to spend the night with her, and then he ends up waking up to find this woman dead. This one is rough. In the bathtub with remnants of her feet and arm in his refrigerator. Oh. Now, this is his blackout. 
thing again. Oh, yeah. He is completely blacked out during this period. But what is even more gruesome is he finds a skillet on the stove with her butt in it. Like, he cut her buttock off and put it in a skillet on the stove. So, allegedly, he collects the body and dumps it into the city dump. But this is where that cannibalism thing comes from. Mm -hmm. Because he has admitted that he doesn't remember if he ate part of her or not. So, while his moniker is the cannibal killer, it's... It's barely applicable. But this this murder here is what gets him the cannibal moniker. Because yeah. whether or not... Like he doesn't remember. He just wakes up to this. And that, again, is a common theme that we hear a lot with serial killers. That, is that they have these blackouts. Well, they disassociate and they don't know what happens. Mm-hmm. Which is a defense mechanism for humans, really, during trauma. He's creating his own trauma by killing these women and is blacking out during it. Crazy town. He describes it as he has no control. When the stuff happens, he has no control. Right. That he can't do anything to prevent it. It's just going to happen. Mm-hmm. Allegedly. Allegedly. Supposedly. I don't know, man. Well, in March of 1978, he ends up receiving a six-month sentence plus three years probation for the car theft that he had committed in Las Vegas the previous year. <laughs> and when he gets out from uh, when he gets out from jail in June of 1978, he goes back and joins Diana. Who? Why does she want any fucking thing to do with this guy? Because it's been what two years now. Who abandoned her? <laughs> And I, she's going to regret that decision. Very much so. In October of 1978, he's actually arrested for drunk, <laughs> what do you know for being drunk, and is charged with a probation violation, but is released on two thousand dollar bond. And that's a lot of money for 1978. That is a lot of money. That is a lot of money for 1978. He's arrested again in November of unknown charges that were reported to his probation officer. No, that were never reported. That were never reported, sorry. So he's breaking pro- probation here, but their charges aren't being reported to him, so nothing is being done. Do you think he, this is a, a compulsion? This breaking the law is a compulsion for him? No, I think he's just a, I think he's a compulsive thief. Mm, okay. And I don't think he's ever held down an actual job without stealing from it and he doesn't know any other way of surviving that's a valid point but that leaves him open in august of 1979 to strangle yet another woman a 39 year old bonnie sue o'neill which after a night of sex when she mentioned that she had to call her husband he flies into a fit of rage strangles her and dumps her body into a garbage can behind a building that they were near. Homeboy's still married to Diana, but he's pissed off at this girl for cheating on her husband, even though he's currently cheating, cheating on, on his wife, Diana. But yeah. I guess he had pretty much made up his mind that the alcoholism and fighting was too much between him and Diana, and she was going to be gone soon anyways, so maybe that's why he didn't think he was cheating i don't know i don't know well it's a very serial ne- killer logic i guess the very next month he decides he's gonna get rid of his wife and actually strangles her he wraps her in blankets and stuffs her into a closet and just leaves and doesn't say anything and nobody really notices much well a neighbor until... does become suspicious after eight days Ugh. a neighbor becomes suspicious reports her to the police the police go and do a well check. They find her body in the fucking closet and get this. They believe that it's fucking accidental. They think that she dies of alcohol poisoning. She's fucking wrapped in a in blankets and stuffed in the closet. He you know wasn't any, even charged. Do you know any alcoholics that wrap themselves full body in a blanket and stuff themselves into a closet like, and then mysteriously <sighs> pass away from alcohol poisoning? I mean, what are the odds that that is what actually happened? Oh my God. Well, he's not charged with anything. They believe her death is accidental and leaves Cole open to returning to Vegas. And here's the best part. He gets a job as a truck driver for a religious charity. Well, don't you know he's Catholic? Oh my 
Good God. <laughs> November 1979, he kills Marie Cushman. Allegedly. Allegedly. In the Casba Hotel. And just leaves her body there. He gets a hotel room with her, strangles her, and then leaves her body in the hotel room. Oh, but you know what? He gets married again on December 16th of 1979. So the very next month, he marries a female co-worker. And this is where he gets tripped up. While on their honeymoon, they get pulled over and he was found to not have a valid driver's license. Now this is a theme for him as well. He consistently doesn't have a valid driver's license and continuously to get in trouble for it. Well, but he probably can't get a valid driver's license. He has so many fucking DUIs. That, that's very true. But after a name check is done on a warrant, they pulled him up for parole violations and he gets in trouble. Eddie ends up at the medical center for federal prisoners. He is released on October 4th of 1980 and is bused back to Dallas. And while in Dallas, he starts stalking women yet again and ends up killing Dorothy King on November 11th. And then the very freaking next day, murders Wanda Faye Roberts. Oh, God, this he's a real human piece of garbage. And has the motherfucking audacity to return to King's home after killing Wanda and has sex with her corpse. He is not going to go unknown for very much longer as he has been identified as being with Roberts on the night of her murder. So he ends up being apprehended during an attack on Sally Thompson. Sadly, the authorities were too late and Thompson was already dead by the time that they got there. But they did interrupt Cole and prevent his having his way with her body. He was caught in the act. He was arrested. And then they actually decided that, you know what? It was an accident. Oh my God. And he was having sex with her dead body. They said that she died from natural causes. Oh my God. And they were about ready to release him. But guilt or, I don't know. He started confessing to a bunch of murders and they were like, whoa, wait. He confessed to 35 killings. According to Cole, at the very least, he was responsible for no less than 14 women over a nine year period. But you know, there, there could have been a few more here and there, as many up to 30 some. But, but he couldn't remember due to his drunkenness. I fucking can't. Cole goes to trial for the murders he had committed in Texas, and then on April 9th of 1981, they did actually find him guilty of those three murders. He did receive a life sentence, single life sentence, not multiple life sentences, even though he brutally murdered and had sex with these dead women. But, you know, I digress. So following the death of his mother in 1984, Cole actually did make a deal or agree to go on trial for the murders that he committed in Nevada. Yes. Well, they sent his ass back to Nevada. Well, Nevada had a death penalty. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not sure if this was his conscious decision of like, all right, I'm fucking done with prison. I, I want to be put to death or what or he felt guilty i don't know i don't have information that's really talking about where he's at mentally at this point maybe the guilt has finally gotten to him because while we know he's a piece of garbage i think he was with it mentally enough to know that killing people was wrong there actually is a really interesting interview it's the very last interview ever done with him before he was put to death mm -hmm and he actually expresses remorse for killing these women and says that he could, should never be trusted around a woman because he would want to kill them. But he ends up getting sent back to Las Vegas on April, in April of 1984 and appears before Judge Mirren Leavitt and pleads guilty to two counts of first-degree murder. Well, Nevada has the death penalty, 
and he says he doesn't want a jury trial. He just wants to plead guilty and be done with it. He actually thanks the judge. Yep. The judge sentences him to die, and his exact response was, thanks, judge. So I don't, I'm getting this information from the big book of serial killers by Jack Rosewood. And it's interesting because it actually says, and this is a direct quote, Cole was led to the converted gas chamber on December 6, 1985 at 1.43 a.m., having been administered sedatives at 12.12 a.m. to keep him relaxed. While he was strapped to the table, the needles were inserted at 2.05 a.m., Following the administration of the lethal drug cocktail, Cole was seen to convulse before his body relaxed again at 2.7 a.m. Minutes later, he was pronounced dead. The execution lasted for only five minutes. There is a really, really good interview with him, though, um, right before his execution. It is the 80s, so keep that in mind. But he does... Um, in the interview, the reporter asks him if he is sorry for killing all the women that he did. And he actually says, yes, he is sorry. He does feel bad for murdering them. And that he often thinks of the 11-year-old girl that he almost killed and wonders what her life is like. That's odd. Yes. Well, that was Carol Edward Cole. <laughs> and I don't know how I feel the mental health care system failed him Mm -hmm. with that being said though i feel like there's more that could have been done on the mental health side at one point why wasn't he it just considered that he was unsafe for society yeah how many times do you have to to seek out psychiatric help and then to admit to say that you want to rape and murder women and strangle them yeah they were well aware I, i i feel like the hospitals severely failed the public here they failed him and they failed us they put more women at danger in danger by allowing him to repeatedly go out i i understand that the police departments weren't communicating at the time they didn't have the technology but i'm struggling with it because he was in a mental health institution frequently where he was very open about his fantasies of wanting to kill people or kill women I should say Mm -hmm. and nothing was done about it and I just I don't know now there are again a lot of unconfirmed deaths where we have to take his word his admissions Mm -hmm. that they actually happened so that brings me to ask you what do you rate him on the Jeffrey scale because this is he, a lot of kills. He's a solid, like, seven and a half, eight for me. I agree. I think that had he continued, that we potentially may have seen more cannibalism and mm, more... Necrophilia. Necrophilia. He, I mean, he was, he's a solid eight. I'm going to go with eight. Yeah. I, I do think this is a good case for nature versus nurture, environmental factors, and the influence of a abusive parent. We know the impact that abuse has on a child's brain. It is very similar to PTSD, sexual trauma, mm-hmm. rewires their brain. I mean, I, I wish I, mean, I would have spent more time looking into how his mom emasculating him. When you are young, what you are presented with is how your brain wires that information. So his mom is consistently showing him that women are not to be trusted over and over and over again, and that women cause you pain. Women are not to be trusted. Women are liars. Women are horrible people. And then that is just continued on. He is emasculated by his mom. He's bested by his female friend as a child. He's continuously tortured for having a female name. And he was molested. And he was molested. So you just compound all of that together. It makes sense that he hates women. He's been shown that women are to be hated. You know, I wonder if he ever had a brain injury from being beaten up so many times by the bullies that would be another interesting thing i often wonder 
if his aunt had taken him in. How differently his life would have been. And had shown him the right amount of motherly affection and that you could be cared for properly by a female figure if that would have had a big impact on him because he was so young when that happened. His mom made a serial killer. Oh, 100%. In my opinion. I agree with you. If she, I, I can understand that she was overwhelmed by having several kids, being low income, and then having to have her husband essentially ripped away from her. I, I understand. I can empathize that that person was going through a tumultuous change in her life. But you do not take it out on your child, then, especially a five-year-old child. I very, I don't think I've ever said this in any one of the podcasts, but I well and truly believe that he would have been a normal kid had it not been for her. I agree. I can get on board with that. All right, girl, we need a palate cleanser. <laughs> Palate cleanser, this, this is, is the palate cleanser. cleanser. All right, let's get some memes. When you meet someone who's into true crime mysteries, did we just become best friends? Yup. I watch true crime documentaries the same way men watch football, with a mouthful of food, shouting unsolicited advice at the screen. <laughs> Ted Bundy throughout his whole trial. I don't know where you're receiving this information from, but it is inaccurate. <laughs> Do y'all ever watch true crime shows and be critiquing the murders? Like, really, Brenda? If you're going to claim an intruder broke in and killed your cheating husband, at least break a window or something. I'm sorry, I can't make it to your get together. I've got six or seven cold cases from the 90s that I need to solve. <sighs> Stays up all night watching true crime murder mysteries on TV. Can't come up with a good alibi as to why I'm late for work. <laughs> Girl, I love astrology. Guy, thinking of something to impress her. I am the Zodiac Killer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. One day, you're 23, enjoying happy hour in a crowded bar. The next, you're in your 30s, avoiding social events and watching murder documentaries to relax. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Octopus, I have eight arms. Jeffrey Dahmer, same. <laughs> oh no. I watch too many true crime shows to let my friends leave with men they don't know. You'll thank me later when all your limbs are still attached, bitch. <laughs> I feel that deep in our soul because we have definitely been those overprotective friends. We're yes. like, bitch, you don't know him. What are you doing? <laughs> Oh, God. All right, guys, you know the drill. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, like, rate, and subscribe. Please and thank you. Follow us on all of our social media at The Killer T. You're more than welcome to follow us on TikTok, but we did not get around to making Tiki Talkies today. But if you do, it's at The Killer T Pod. Yes. You can also email us if you feel like it at thekillert at gmail.com. All right, y'all. Until next time. Bye. Bye. Join us on the next episode where we discuss the Sisters Without Mercy, Rhea and, and Sakina. Sakina.
Schlag ab.